uh, before we start, I just wanted to share if you're new here, um, Pediatric Music Therapy is a community I started um, this year to help students and music therapists feel more confident making clinical decisions um, and feel empowered in their community and to help develop um, just like a better connection between one another. So today I'm so lucky to have Brian Shrek here with us. Um, and Brian Shrek is a board certified music therapist who has been professionally serving people with a wide range of medical illnesses since 2004. Mr. Shrek received a bachelor's of arts in music therapy from Berkeley College of Music in Boston and a master's of arts in music therapy from New York University. He pioneered music therapy services at St. Vincent's Catholic Hospital Medical Center in Manhattan and Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Mr. Shrek has a passion for palliative care and supporting patients and their families through end of life and into bereavement. He uses the sounds of a patient's life to create innovative and individualized recordings and projects. Specific techniques include stethoscopes and microphones to capture internal sounds to connect with the external world through ongoing clinical and therapeutic support. He strives to improve the quality of life for every patient and family through the ongoing use of music therapy. He currently serves all people of all ages diagnosed with cancer and their families at Norton Cancer Center, Norton Cancer Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. So thank you so much for taking your afternoon, evening to hang out with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. I uh, have really enjoyed just getting to know more people in this very niche world that we live in. Um, so I, I think it's gonna be cool to hear from somebody who has the experience in the adult centers as well as pediatrics. Um, so I'm just gonna jump into it. Um, why did go. you decide to pursue medical music therapy? Well, I think I knew that I, I wanted to do music therapy Well, at a young age. Um, I used to practice the saxophone when I was in fourth grade. <laughs> and around that time, my mom was delivering communion at our local neighborhood nursing home. So she would, you know, take me around and I would have favorite patients. And, and it got me used to just kind of that older side of life, the other part of life that no one really gets to see unless you're in a nursing home. And so I kind of developed some early skills, even as a little guy, <laughs> of just not being afraid of them, not being, a, you know, worried about how gross it smelled and everything else. And, and then there was a time where she was like, I, I can tell you're bored. Why don't you go practice your saxophone in the day room and to see if anyone wants to listen to it. Yeah. And I saw some magic happen. I saw some eyes brighten. I saw some people start to dance a little bit. And I was like, there's something to this. So I think I was going to be a musician anyway, but I knew that there was an unexpected group of people that were well deserving of some sort of experience like this. And I think that's really what keeps me going every day is that no one is really expecting this to be happening. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's so cool that your mom kind of introduced you to music therapy in a way yeah. uh, without it being music therapy. That's really cool. Um, so who are your biggest music therapy supporters that got you where you are today? I know oh, you've wow. done a lot of like innovation um, and you started the program at Cincinnati Children's mm -hmm. and um, in Manhattan, right? Yeah, I was the first music therapist at both of those locations. Um, Unfortunately, the place in Manhattan is no longer there. Oh. It's not even a hospital anymore. Um, but it was a cool, neat old hospital over in the West Village. It was kind of well known and famous in the 80s as the Mecca for AIDS treatment. Mm. And a lot of it was just because of the neighborhood being very um, pro-gay and just very open to all, all walks of life. Um, and then um, it served the whole lower Manhattan as well. So they were kind of the first ones on the scene getting people from the World Trade Center back when that happened too. So it was, it was a really cool place to be and work and it was very old and strange. Uh, but it's where I cut my teeth um, being 23-ish and, you know, being a, a white kid from Kentucky. Sorry. Being... <laughs> Yeah, with 
with all sorts of people from very fancy, you know, aristocrats to homeless people um, and everyone else in between. And I think, uh, yeah, it just got me sort of, it thickened my skin. Yeah. Um, being in New York and living in New York kind of does it anyway. Um, Cause it's, it's so, it's all about surviving really and making connections. So if you want a gig, you got to get it. it. No one's going to like roll out a red carpet for you. It's like, if you want this, you have to go get it yourself and figure out every little part of it. Yeah. Um, and I think it's so impressive that you did that in, you started a program in a place like that. My sister lives in Brooklyn. So I, been around New York City and I find it very overwhelming. Um, it I lived is. here in Memphis and started a program and found that overwhelming. So mm -hmm. I can't imagine with New York City on top of that. Yeah, you'd leave in the morning around, you know, six and plan not to be home for 15 or 18 hours, it felt like. <laughs> so it was like going on a little trip every day. Yeah. Yeah. So who do you feel like your supporters were? In so my supporters, so that first support, I mean, so I, I can start back at Berkeley with Suzanne Hanser and Karen Wax, Peggy Cotting, Kimberly Kerr, um, who's coming from the New York side of life as well. So she introduced me to Clive Robbins and I got to spend a whole year hanging out with him, which was incredible. Wow. Um, so I would say Clive and all, all the NYU people like Susan Feiner, Susan, I mean, there's 10 Susans that are all amazing. Um, <laughs> but then my internship with Joanne Lowy uh, was really, she's been a, a shining star and advocate wow. for me since the beginning. And that, I mean, to tell you the truth, my first job was from a presentation we were giving as interns. And I was just sort of describing a case I was working on and there was a nurse practitioner in the audience who had a grant for a very small amount of money to start a little music therapy pilot. Mm -hmm. So that's how that first gig started was by doing a presentation. And so you never know who's in the audience and Absolutely. it might catch their attention. Um, this little study that just came out uh, from Arkansas Children's was very similar. I was presenting um, in Minneapolis at a, it was a symposium for pediatric nursing. It's called SPN. And I got to do a keynote and there was all these nurses from all over the country. And one of them came up afterwards and was like, I love this. I want to do this. We need to do some work together. Yeah. And many years later that came out of that. So I think advocating is, is all about spreading the word and being in the right places, you know, not necessarily just music therapy specific places to to share this the good word and you never know who what might come of those interactions with people those connections for sure yeah. I didn't know that you interned with Joanne Lowy that is too cool I did so yeah so that was kind of an evolution in New York of of her showing me the ways of of that kind of set the stage for me to be able to walk around by myself in a new hospital <laughs> with all sorts of new patients that were certainly not expecting me would ask me how old I am, what do I know about anything, you know, and and really just getting used to being with people and not being afraid of them. I think that was the key at first. Yeah, I think that's so key. And I think that you hit the nail on the head on having to be alone and in introducing services because you're kind of doing that all the time and advocating for who you are and what you're bringing. Totally. Because, I mean, not everybody knows about music therapy or is in the right headspace to be thinking about what that could mean for them. Um, so that, that's really cool. Um, and I love your article as well. I read it in Journal of Palliative Medicine, right? Yeah, yeah thanks. It is great. Um, and Andrew is also a wonderful music therapist. Andrew's you know? wonderful. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So what I've really liked about pediatric music therapy and having this creative space for us is that I've gotten to meet a lot of music therapists and also students who remind me a lot of myself where I just knew this was the population I wanted to be in. I wanted to be in the medical setting. Um, so if you could give your past student self a piece of advice, what do you think it would be? I think it, there was such a worry about knowing every song on earth. Um, <laughs> 
that I kind of took to heart in a funny way. And, you know, coming from Berkeley and then being in New York for many years after that. And I remember talking to Barbara Hesser, who was the head of NYU at the time. And she was like, you don't need to know every song. She was like, most of this is your ability to connect with people. And you, none of these songs matter unless you're in the room. Yeah. So if, if you can't get into the room, it doesn't matter. <laughs> none of this matters, really. And it was just a, a lovely way to just sort of remind myself that you don't need to know everything. I still don't know most things. Um, I go into every day being sort of surprised with what I do know um, and taking a confidence with me from the previous day that I know we will get through this day. And it's something that is sort of my slogan with all of my patients. It's like, I like to make a very strong eye contact at the end of every session and be like, we're gonna get through this day. And it's just an affirmation of, of making your way through the world. And at the bottom line, just trying to be a helper. And I feel like once people realize that you are trying to help them, sometimes the music's in bold face, sometimes it's not. Um, yeah. And I think I was the same way as a student. I felt like, you know, I am impressed so much by your guitar skills. Guitar was very new to me when I first started school and feeling very like I didn't have something to offer because guitar wasn't my primary instrument. I couldn't do some of the things that maybe you hear on a record, mm -hmm. um, but that so much of what we do isn't necessarily the music piece. It's the connection piece. And I wish there was like a class in school that they could kind of tailor to that. It's hard to kind of quantify sometimes like how to make connections with people um, and just the authenticity that I think has to come into that, if that makes sense. It does. And I think a lot of that can happen also with playing music outside of this profession, yeah. connecting with people, um, what it's like to play in a group of people that you don't know, what it's like to sort of sit in and be expected to do something that, you know, you might be nervous about and being successful at it um, yeah. just by trying. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like improvisation is the key to my music therapy life. Um, I mean, it's how I get through every day as well as, <laughs> and even with my stratification of prioritizing the millions of patients to see today, um, yeah. things change and then you have to rearrange, react. Recalibrate. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And you might be in a different key than right. you thought you might be in. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm so interested in the answer to your question, uh, this question, because um, I started my career out when I was very young here at St. Jude and trying to get my feet wet and figuring out what that was going to look like. Um, so my first year was fraught with lots of not knowing what things were going to be like. Um, but what do you think the hardest piece about your first year as a medical music therapist was? I think that having the courage to step up to my own plate, but also realizing that none of this is going to happen unless I believe in it. Like no patient's going to believe in it if I'm nervous about it. So I think there's, there has to be this sort of gut feeling that no matter what you're supposed to be there. And if you're knocking on someone's door, and they're impatient. You know, I like to think that it's like you're knocking on their bedroom door at their house. Yeah. So, so if you don't know why you're standing there, <laughs> you have no business knocking on their door. Because mm -hmm. you're finding them most often in a vulnerable state of some sort just because they're in a gown, they're in a bed, and you're coming at them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot going on. And I've been thinking about it a lot just in the last five years being solely basically with adults is that you have to just be so careful and respectful just at the very beginning of that mm -hmm. like waiting for an answer before you walk in yes after you knock um and that's not the norm necessarily no not no. necessarily bringing in an instrument at all yeah. to begin with having it ready outside maybe but figuring out the room first seeing if they're half asleep, seeing if their partner's asleep, uh, if 
I don't know, can you get them a blanket? Is it more important to get them up and out of the bed to go to the bathroom first before they can even concentrate on anything that we would be doing? Um, and I, yeah, not to interrupt. I think too, that's such a good piece where there's times where I hear things like, not necessarily at my work, but just you hear things where it's, that's not my job. I think our job is to help the patient grab a blanket or if they need something, you know, that's not just a nurse job. That's like a healthcare job. Totally. And yeah. setting up that room, I think is so important. And once they know that you've done these lovely things for them, then they might be ready to hear your stick about what it is <laughs> that you have in mind to do. Yeah. But yeah, I think the, the ability to get past that threshold, you know, there's such a different body chemistry that can even happen. If you're standing at the door sort of not even fully in and trying to describe something yeah. from that far away versus coming right in, you know, after they say, come in and washing your hands like you're supposed to be there and then sitting down and being like, hi. Yeah. I'm Brian. Like I'm Brian first. Yes. And then I'm, my job is this, but that means a whole lot of different things for you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of the commercials you see, you know, I think as medical music therapists, we are featured in a lot of that because it looks cool and it is very like aesthetically pleasing, but it's not always a guitar and like somebody playing a drum or right. anything like that. <laughs> but that's all you see, right? Like you see the guitar and the drum, but mm -hmm. it might be a freestyle rap or it might be um, like, totally. I've had some crazy instruments, so. Yeah, And I feel like with adults half the time, I'm doing music assisted relaxations where they're going, I'm hoping that they will fall asleep. I hope that it is so boring that they will fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But um, it takes a certain skill level too to, to make them feel comfortable enough to want to fall asleep if that's the intention. Yeah, you I know, often like, think about like if I was in the hospital, if I would want music therapy. I don't yeah. know what my answer would be. Like, I think there'd be some vulnerability there. Totally. Uh, and like you said, falling asleep with somebody you don't know necessarily yeah. super well in the room. Yeah. Um, so do you work on a team at Norton? I can't remember if there are other people there with you. I do. There's, there's a few music therapists, but there's one other in the Cancer Institute and the rest are in different areas of the hospital. Yeah. And you guys have kind of spread out, right? Like it's not we one do. central building. Yeah. Yeah, um, so there's four different hospitals, basically. Okay. Yeah. So what- but There's six of us. Okay. Is there a piece of advice you have about working on a team? I don't know if you guys get to work together a lot or how- We do. And a lot of it's through advocating for each other. I think it's important, even if you don't work holding hands with someone, you know, they still represent the field and anything we can do to talk them up and- to any other the, the interdisciplinary teams, doctors, nurses, whoever. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that goes for even people that you are working closely with. I work closely with this, it's called behavioral oncology and they're mostly nurse practitioners. They're kind of like psychiatrists. So they do talk therapy, but they can also do med changes. Um, and yeah, we're always talking each other up. And there, there is some really, I think productive things that can happen if someone has sort of planted a seed even before you get there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if we're constantly sort of building each other up, it's not like, oh, the therapist is coming because I'm having problems. <laughs> or it's like, oh, the music therapist is gonna come in and sing me a song to cheer me up. Right. Yeah, and it's more of like some specifics of, oh, there's some cool recordings that we can do. I know that you're worried that you're not gonna see your daughter for Christmas. So there's this guy that can help with some of that. So once yeah. they know that there's sort of a way that you can connect, uh, I think that's important. But going back to advice for team members, um, you know, personalities are so strong, especially in our field. Yes. And there, there is kind of like a competition uh -huh. yeah. that can be kind of um, irritating, in my opinion. Yes. And it, it should be all, all of us should be doing what I was just saying of just trying to lift one another up. And that could be celebrating an article that has been written. And that could be about spreading the word like you're doing um, to try to connect all of us and share good thoughts together. 
Um, if there's someone I feel like on your team that you really don't like, I, I invite you to feel just what it might, how it might, I guess, change your experience if you pretended that they were one of your best friends. Yeah. Because I have a lot of best friends. That can, yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of people that I love that are ridiculous sometimes, but that doesn't mean I'm going to like bite their head off and be like, I don't ever want to work with you again. Yeah. Um, and I think also there, there's um, apprehension a lot of times to have a crucial conversation. Mm -hmm. And it could be very simple. And I mean, it could take a few sentences just to sort of smooth things over. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, in that situation, this happened. This is how I felt. This is what I thought maybe you were thinking. I'm assuming right now. Is that true? No, it's not. I mean, okay. Mm -hmm. and, I th and I think I'm, you know, 16 years deep in this. I feel like there's, I've come across and gotten my feelings hurt and really probably out of, I don't know, just my own ego centricity, thinking that music therapy is bigger and more important than it might be to someone else. Yeah. <laughs> it's not everybody's whole world. All no, and it's not something that everyone's thinking about 1000% of the day like I am. Yeah. And it's good to sort of just reframe that in your own, uh, I don't know, mind's eye. I like to remind myself that in this very large corporation of Norton Healthcare, there's six of us out of like 15,000. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> yeah, so I might be like super wound up that marketing said something funny that I didn't like. And it's like, I mean, come on. Yeah. There's a bigger I, fish to fry. I, think that, I just love that you said that. And I think that you're so right that there's this competitive feeling sometimes. But I remind myself and my interns and anyone around, you know, we already have so much adversity sometimes, like yeah. you said, getting into the room or like advocating for music therapy. And if we're all kind of minimizing each other versus being a team, yeah. <laughs> a team, like a team, like you and I, a team, like everyone totally. in this whole community. Yeah. And celebrating I, each other and sharing yeah. our work and working together on research. Yeah. I mean, I just between us, I hate reading and writing about music therapy. Um, at the end of an eight or nine or 10 hour day, I don't want to come home what? and think more about this and write more about this and yeah. try it. I mean, so I mean, there, we, have, we need each other's support and yeah. we need help and it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to share knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I also don't believe that it needs to be some fancy business model either where Right. I'm charging you every time that I'm going to give you some advice or whatever. Um, I, I respect the people in our field that do that. Um, it's just not me. Yeah. And I think staying true to whatever music therapy looks like for you. I, I've noticed that about you, that you um, seem very true to yourself and authentic to what music therapy looks like for you. And I just really appreciate that because there isn't just one way to do things or one no. way to see things. So... Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. we're all in the same band. We're all in the same band and we can all take a solo when it's time. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to keep yeah. that as like a little nugget. <laughs> um, so what's one task that you have never thought would be a part of your work that you find yourself doing frequently? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> all of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Every day there's, uh, I mean, yeah, just... Just trying to to be present and open enough to take on what other people's stuff is. Um, I feel like that is the most difficult thing that we have to do. Um, and I try to see quite a lot of people throughout a day. And sometimes I bite off way more than I should have. Um, that as well. <laughs> and then, you know, I... I don't mean to do this, but my family's not quite ready for the state that I'm in when I get home. Yeah. So I think there is a balance of, so I would, my advice would then be to, there are some things that can wait for tomorrow. Um, there's typically not a music therapy emergency. Um, <laughs> exactly. Even if it is some end of life situation that you really want to be a part of, you know, that might be more of your thought than theirs. Yes. 
And that's what I say too, as far as some of this, like being there at end of life, like that is such an intimate space that they may want music therapy, but they may not. And being okay with like, sometimes helping is stepping away. Um, Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And and the ongoing relationship that you have with them. So I, I like to see people for many, many, many months. And in my opinion, I like being their therapist. So I don't like unless there's a reason to pass it along to one of the other six, even if it's inconvenient for me to travel to that location to see them, if they pop up at one of the other places, I think it's more important for them, for me to be that consistent person that they can press pause instead of starting all over from the beginning. Yeah. And how it might mean, yeah. Yeah. And that might mean that they might not get this every day, but when it happens, it's good. Yeah that's really cool that you guys have that relationship too, where you can bounce from building or hospital to hospital where you need to. So I think that is something that's really cool. Yes. Uh, so if you were a patient undergoing a long-term hospitalization, how do you think you'd handle the experience? Of me coming yeah. to see me? Or just being a patient, like a long-term patient in the hospital, how do you think you would handle oh, I, that? I think that's a good guide for all, like to sort of litmus test anything that you might want to do with anybody that you're trying to serve. Yeah. You know, is this something that you would want? <laughs> um, is it okay to be, to say no and to deal with that? Is it okay to, because you think about all the nice people that really have to work up the courage to be like, you know what, I'm, this is not a good time right now. So I think it's our job to really be almost like hyper aware and keen to these simple little body languages and things that are going unsaid that they might not want this right now. Yeah. And that's totally fine. And I think it's okay to even say that out loud that I'm, I can tell that you're very tired right now. I'm going to come back another time. And then there's like a sigh of relief that you can almost see of them. Yeah. But they're so nice, they might be, you know, and this is the complete opposite of being in New York, where they might throw every colorful <laughs> right. word at you in the world of please get out of here um, <laughs> faster. Yeah, yeah. Please leave faster. <laughs> I grew up in Louisville as well. I went uh, to school in Oldham County. So I uh, am very used to like Southern hospitality. <laughs> yeah. We see a lot of that. But yeah, you're right. Like boundaries are going to look different for everybody. And Maybe that no was the hardest thing that they could say. Um, but yeah, honoring that and being okay and checking your ego and knowing it's not like a personal thing. And yeah. not feeling like for it to be a great music therapy session, it needs to be 90 minutes. Yeah. You know, it could be 15, especially yeah. if they are going to be there for a long, long time. You don't want to show all your cards the first day. <laughs> to me, you, I want them wanting more. And I'm aware of that even in the middle of a song. You know, they might not want every verse of a song. They might not want, I mean, thinking more about you, like has someone ever sang you a song (laughs) with you, just for you, just you sitting there? Yeah, I don't actually think so. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think that is such an important thing to think about. Like I have a cousin that loves the spotlight and loves to sing and... And if you get a microphone, he's going to not just play one. He's going to play 15 yeah, songs. Think. Yeah, absolutely. And he loves it. And he's thinking everyone's loving it. And some people <laughs> might be like, okay. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I think a lot of patients, could, especially adult patients, um, uh-huh. might feel that way too. So I think full songs are overrated. But, I think yeah. maybe a little nugget of it and maybe a verse, maybe especially if they know the chorus. Especially right. if it's really just to get them sort of in another space mentally uh, and emotionally. I think if we can get through one course of a song and then maybe improvise a little bit and then keep on talking, I think that's way cooler than someone not Bring picking up any cues yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to play every verse of this song because you love it. You told me that you loved it. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and they might not love that. <laughs> And yeah. going back to me being the patient, I wouldn't love that. I'd be like, when is this person leaving? Yeah. <laughs> this is a long song. I should have chosen a lot shorter. Yeah. This and this is a lot. Yeah. 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 Um, so what are three qualities that you think are necessary for someone who wants to be a medical music therapist? I think you have to have an internal drive 
to be a helpful sort of server and yeah. servant to the healthcare system. Um, you have to be willing to kind of go into scary places. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very privileged and I'm very aware of that, that I'm able to work right now mm -hmm. and I'm able to do inpatient and outpatient physical. I'm in their room, yeah, music therapy, not over telehealth. So, um, and there's a lot of patients that are coming down with this virus. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like we're wearing more and more PPE every day a little bit. Yep. And, you know, it's just part of the gig. Um, and there's days that it's, it's exhausting just to sort of be in, in the place. Yeah. So I think, um, you have to be open to sort of get, get dirty and be gross, um, see gross things mm -hmm. and be okay with it. Because I feel like if we're kind of this constant, I don't know, container or safe space maker of someone knowing that you don't think that they're gross that you don't think that what's happening to them is gross or weird and that you can sort of see through all that and know that they're wonderful and beautiful and say that to them. Uh, I think a lot of really wonderful things can happen out of that. Yeah. And then you're in, like once you're in, no matter what's going on and going back to that end of life situation, if you have gone through many of these through many months, when you knock on their door and things are bad, you might be a lucky one that has that backstage pass rapport yeah. that they're like, come on in. Mm -hmm. They would love to see you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to be, there's an unconditional love. So you have to be able to be okay with gross things. You have to be <laughs> unconditional and sort of this. And I remember talking to Clive Robbins. I did an interview with him before I left New York. Um, and it was about, it, it ended up being about an hour long and he wasn't expecting this. And it was really just talking about clinical love. Um, yeah. this, this place that I was very attracted to and intrigued by his ability to, in any of the videos that you see of him, look like he truly loved them yeah. and was happy that not only that they were alive and that he was helping them, but that he wanted to continue to help them. <laughs> and to me, that's just kind of like this feeling of like, how, how is that possible? And it was very, he wasn't expecting to have a conversation about that from a student. And it really was kind of like an existential, like this is the big part of the work, I think. Mm -hmm. It's kind of having an unconditional love, no matter if you know, you're working with someone that's racist or yes. someone that says something terrible about something else mm -hmm. or something that goes against every grain inside of you to look past all that and be like, that is none of my business. This is not why I'm here. I'm here for this other reason. And I'm not going to hate you because you are different than me. And yeah. I think going into that, you know, I think, so that's two things. The third thing would be, you know, having music to yourself too. Because I think I love playing the guitar and I hope that that comes through when I'm with a patient. And that's because I might, after we're done talking right now, go sit by the TV for a while and noodle around just because it makes me feel good too. Yeah. So finding that connection outside of this, it's not homework anymore. This is your life yeah. and having that Very feeling and, and connecting with people and maybe f writing your own song mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, there's so many cool things we can do with technology right now. If you do have a favorite colleague or musician that you met at school and they live somewhere else now you could say hey you remember that one thing we did that one time <laughs> I wrote this little part to it and then why don't you send it back my way and then you can feel invigorated again about almost yeah. why you decided to do this in the first place which was music is at the bottom of all of it it has to be somehow yeah I think that is so important you know Ami Kunimara talks a lot about clinification of music and like just having it serve a means. And I've definitely felt that at points in my life where it's like, I'm singing the song, but I feel nothing <laughs> in it. Yeah. Um, and then having those times where you come back and I'm not a pianist, but playing piano and like singing something that I really enjoy and thinking like, oh, this moved me. Um, and 
I hope that's for my patients and I hope that I can express that in a way. Totally. As well. And I think even taking that, I'm not a pianist out of our vocabulary. Like as a, <laughs> yes. as a music therapist, we might not be completely adept at every instrument, but I feel like we, ha- we have a willingness to try. Yeah. And even if we're not an expert at it, I feel like we need to have that sort of internal confidence that we we are this music we are whatever it is good or bad ugly sad <laughs> happy or whatever yeah. you know and it's but yeah lifting each other up that way too and and being i don't know happy to be wherever you are on your instrument mm-hmm. you know yeah. kind of taking that hard. pressure off that you yeah. need to be something that you're not like it's okay to be who you are right now mm-hmm yeah, absolutely. So um, switching gears a little bit, I you're by yourself at your specific site at Norton? Sort of. Okay. Yeah, I guess you guys are kind of interconnected there. But how do you prioritize? You said you have a pretty large caseload. How do you go about trying to manage that in any kind of way? It's tough. So I think, I mean, there is a, a stratification of if someone, you know, is in pain is a new referral, like if we're thinking cancer treatments, if this is their first treatment. um, So to me, those rise to the top. The ones that are, that I've worked with in the last day or two, I might wait a few days to see them again, if I know they're going to be there for a while. If there's a project we're working on, they kind of make a priority. If it's someone that is actively calling for a referral, I'll go see them. And, you know, obviously if a, a doctor or a nurse sends a text or a page yeah. or an email saying, hey, I, I, I was talking to them, I think that it would really be great for you to see them as soon as possible. Um, yeah. And meeting them at the different parts of their, where they are is important too. So if you meet someone on their first day of treatment, you might have a, a really long, wonderful therapeutic relationship with that person. Yeah. Um, If you're meeting them right at the end of life and you've never met them before today, there's a lot of difficulties sort of just innate in that landscape. Um, And then it's like, so some of those become priorities just because there might be something that you want to do, like a heartbeat recording or trying to get them to say, I love you, which might not happen tomorrow. And that might be worth coming in for or staying late for. Um, Yeah. But it's more the ability to connect with their family, too, and make them feel safe and not have a wild agenda and not overstaying your welcome. Yeah. And if it's going to be more of like a music assisted relaxation instrumental thing in the background, you don't need to belt out a song that they love or you don't have, you know, (laughs) it can be very much in the background and then leave. (laughs) Yeah. get out of there it takes a lot of energy I can only imagine some of these families when you are trying to kind of hold all the pieces together like you're saying at end of life and then trying to put on a face for somebody who's coming in and trying to help and you know that they're trying to help I mean I can only imagine but and they're overwhelmed and yeah. there's so much going on and now yeah. with COVID with not many people allowed to come right. there's like this extra grief that more people can't come than normally would Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's being a helpful person first and trying to find out quickly what would be helpful right, right this second. Yeah. Um, absolutely. yeah. And I think there is a lot that can be done in a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think you are so right about, it doesn't have to be a 90 minute session. It doesn't have to be a 30 minute session. It, it is what it is. And it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so speaking of how things kind of go. Tell me about a session that didn't go the way you had hoped or planned and what you kind of learned from that. I think, I mean, some of this can happen in that casual rapport building, non-music therapy stuff that happens where you might slowly and steadily put your own foot in your mouth um, by making an assumption of just your language of who do you have here with you? Yeah. Instead of saying something more general, like, tell me about your family or tell me, you know, there's so many ways that you could phrase something by not saying, oh, is that your mom? No, yeah. it's my wife. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> oh, is, oh who, is this, who is this great. over here? He, is this your friend? No, it's my stepdad. Um, oh, but you look the same age. You know, it's like these things that you don't need to say. Yeah. And it you usually look it, different for everybody. Yeah. And it usually stems out of an assumption that you're not completely in clinical mode mm -hmm. of being thoughtful of everything that you're saying and more casual. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in those moments that you can sort of step off the, I don't know, the path a little bit and get into trouble. Yeah. So yeah, there, there's been two times recently where I've mis mistook someone that I guessed was another part of their family that wasn't. Yeah. And, and then you feel the awkwardness or tension oh my that God. Might come from that. Yeah. And it just, yeah. it's, it's there forever now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard to, to work your way back mm -hmm. in, but yeah, just being very careful with your language sometimes, and especially with adults. It's a lot easier with kids, I think, to be, you know, in a, a kind of similar place with each person that you're serving. Yeah. But if their family's present, you know, they're, they're essentially, in my mind, the, the children of the patients I'm working with now. Mm -hmm. So it's all the same family that you're serving for the <laughs> most part. It could just be the younger or the older that you're you know, is the, the key person. Yeah. But sometimes they're not the main person that, you know, you might find out through your assessment that the patient's actually doing fine. It's everyone else that's not. Yeah. And then figuring out a way to help that and be helpful in that situation. Yeah. But yeah, I so think- much more than just the person in the bed. Like totally. Like there's so many people involved. There are. That's family and, care is. Right. And to acknowledge that and to make them feel helpful too and to- Give them a time, you know, I'm thinking back to this end of life thing. People are, uh, you know, kind of afraid to be near the bed sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's like, everybody get close, like, let's get closer. So you can be sort of the orchestrator to make people come together and to give them these okay. cues that, that they might not just even later, they're like, oh, I'm so thankful that I got to hold their hand mm -hmm. or climb in bed with them. Or, you know what I mean? Like anything that is not off in the corner on their laptop trying to do a million things. And yeah. And I think with all the tubes or breathing equipment or they're acting different, they might not want to hurt them, but we know mm. that, like you said, you can go into bed and cuddle with your spouse or um, hold their hand or whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, they're, they're still the same person and you're not going to hurt them or we're going to orchestrate this where you won't be in the way of those things. Yes, and to talk to them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, all these little things that people can forget when things are overwhelmed. Get tense. Yeah, and overwhelming. So what do you think is a common misconception about your work? Oh, I mean, there's nothing more that irritates me, especially <laughs> if I'm in a really bad mood. Um, when I see someone sweet, it's like, oh, it's so nice that you volunteer here. <laughs> yeah. or did you know that they have pet therapy here like they're telling me they're asking me if i i know that <laughs> and it's like I, I do know that they are here as well yeah. but yeah being in the same sentence with a pet or a dog um is, we're it, different <laughs> yeah and it depends on how snarky i'm feeling that day you know if, if i know that they're a worker in the hospital i might say something snarky a little bit like yeah we went to the same the same <laughs> school. Or I'll wag my tail for class. you. Yeah. I'll jump on your bed if you want. And <laughs> yeah. And sometimes people don't mean anything bad by they it. And don't. sometimes that makes me more irritated because yeah. you just like wish that you didn't have to advocate all the time, but you do, right? Like that's you just do. part of what comes with it. It's um, part of the gig. Yeah. And that goes yeah. from the very top. And you never know who's in the room. And I've found out being back in Louisville, there are people that might be very connected to different families, even in the organization. Yeah. So just being very, very aware of how you're talking and what you're talking about and who yeah. they might not, you know, their brother may be the CFO. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not somebody you want to necessarily be super rude to. To turn off to, but then that could be a very cool advocating. Right. You know, that the CFO might not even know that there's a music therapist here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
So, so yeah, it's kind of always being on. Yeah. And that can take a lot of energy too. So sometimes when you're having a crazy day and then I remember a day so vividly where I was with a patient on the BMT unit and the nurse meaning all the goodness in the world said like, oh, your job is so much more fun. Like you never have to do anything hard. And I was so upset and I didn't, like I was in the room, there's a patient, it wasn't the time, but like that we all have difficulties. It's not just yeah. you guys and they, nurses have plenty of difficulties, but they do. We all, we all are in this together and it's all difficult work. It is. Yeah. So I, I bet I know a little bit of your answer, but I'm, I would love to hear a little bit more about um, what types of interactions that you feel most passionate about in music therapy. I love, I mean, I love getting to know these people and trying to find that place that, you know, I've been thinking about since I started this with, you know, back to those Clive Robin thoughts of like, how, how do I find this, this clinical love that can be very functional? And I feel like once that is established, you can kind of go anywhere and you can, you might even be able to push conversations and ask questions that may be terrifying mm -hmm. and maybe no one else is asking even. Um, and since we're not super medical, we can kind of live in that, that area of in between the patient and the care team and we can tell them also things that we've learned about them that they might not know either. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I don't know. I feel like getting to these places where it's obvious that they know that this is important. Um, our work is not like painting or cutting grass where you get to see immediately Result. the hard work that you've put into it. And I think that takes a long time to get used to. Yeah. I like the piece you said too about hearing things that maybe the medical staff doesn't. I think that for me, I've noticed a real fear, especially from parents to be judged or um, to be like labeled as difficult parents or difficult oh, sure. patients. So if there is a concern, I know sometimes it might feel really scary to bring it up to a doctor or a nurse who might label that person as a difficult parent or patient. Um, and being able with our relationships with the rest of the medical staff, being able to go into it in a way that's non-judgmental and is supportive um, of one another, so. Totally. Yeah. And, and even thinking more generally about like even men and women and mm -hmm. cultures and being aware of that and someone like a father or a male might yell something nasty which kind of causes that black mark on them right. to be like they are difficult yeah and now that's sort of permeated through the whole team of oh don't go in there he's kind of a jerk mm -hmm. and that's i mean you come to find out that they're just scared yeah and that's you know there's there is that way that I feel like, you know, especially dads and the male caregivers can show their fear is through anger. And that's not often taken, I don't know, in a way that, well. yeah, well by anyone. And yeah. they know that they shouldn't be yelling at anyone. But at the same but time, in society, it's okay. we teach men that you know, this is the way you can express anger, but sadness is like not in right. that equation. Yeah. And they might be sobbing five minutes later in the bathroom, yeah. the fact that they did that and they feel terrible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can be their, their apology to the team. Like, Hey, yeah. I talked to him right after that. And he said, he can't believe that he exploded, but he's overwhelmed and has having the worst day of his life. Yeah. And I feel like that's an, so maybe that would be a fourth part about being able to do this work is being able to understand that people are having a horrible day and they might have a lot of reactions that are uneasy and unfriendly and they shouldn't be misinterpreted by us through assumptions that they might not want this. It's more of you caught them at that precise time where everything was falling apart. Yeah. And they might've had 20 people walk into the room wanting something yep. like that whole morning. 
Um, and I think that's part of what cracks me up and I, I get it, right? Why we have videos about music therapy and everybody's happy and like the kids playing and whatever, but that's not like even like a 10% of my day usually. It's I know. usually people who are in the hospital because they're feeling terrible and this is the worst period of their life. Um, so it doesn't really look like that. And like, I want students to know that's not really what it looks like no. um, and not to be like jarred by that um, or surprised. Yeah. And that can, that can even be like a conversational piece that you're being met at the door by a concerned parent, not to disturb their child mm -hmm. um, that they're not feeling well. Why don't you come back a little bit later when they're feeling better? Yeah. And that could be a one just like quick response of, if they were feeling great, I wouldn't really have a reason to come see them. Yeah. So actually today, this is perfect right now if they're yeah. not feeling great. They don't have to be on no. or like performing in any way. No. Yeah. So tell me about a patient or a patient interaction that changed your practice. So I, would, I would, <laughs> yeah, I, want, I will go all the way back to my internship. Um, I was probably 20 one or two and this was a young lady so she was 34 uh, metastatic breast cancer it had really gotten terrible and she probably had maybe six weeks to live and I got to work with her maybe five or six times once a week and she just seemed to really open up to the fact that some of these memories were unlocked through just trying out some of these instruments, like even just like a little instrument tour. And she started talking about sneaking out in Puerto Rico and going to the beach and going and like her whole demeanor changed. And then we started to dance a little bit. So I feel like there's this like, we forget that music can inspire physical movement, which means right. that they could go from being totally lousy and under the covers to up and at them to out of their bed moving around and shaking their money makers um <laughs> and so I was just so impressed that she was able to access these thoughts in the midst of excruciating pain and then you know I'm just like very basic music therapy interventions like like she was having difficulty breathing and I was like you know if, singing feels counterintuitive right now but we could just do one tone and you're actually going to take in more mm -hmm. breath than you might think and then you're going to blow it out a little bit slower and then she started to calm down and a lot of it was more of a psychosomatic thought that she couldn't breathe versus yeah. literally not being able to breathe and but she was not talking as much because of that and once she so i mean she like started to really use these things that I was trying to show her. And a few days later, she was not talking at all anymore and unresponsive. And her cousin finally arrived from Puerto Rico. And I started just our little, we had one little song that we sort of made up together. And it was just basically me saying hola. <laughs> That's awesome. And her cousin was like, oh my God, she was like, she did this to me last night when I got here. And it was a long sing-songy hola. Oh. And she was like, and that was the last thing that she's said. Yeah. So, and then she died the next day. And, but her cousin was like, I am so glad that I was able to, to know that she knew that I was there. Yeah. So yeah, so that was kind of a game changer of like, oh, this makes sense, it works. And it helped this family in the midst of things that none of it was working. Yeah. And I think just being like, I am always at awe at the things that we're able to like have happen sometimes. Like I was with a patient a couple of weeks ago who was passing away and um, you know, the doctor was singing, the chaplain was singing. I was singing like all around this patient with her grandmother and, you know, just, how cool that can be and like not taking that for granted, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Cause it doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But those aha moments can sort of bury in your heart and in your soul and be like, okay, now I know that that can happen. 
I'm going to try to make this happen again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, how do you keep yourself grounded or what's a way that you practice self-care? I like, uh, I like to play music. Um, I play with a few different people in town and I can kind of break my brain out of the horrible day that may have happened at the hospital. Um, my kids are, I have a 14 year old and an almost 12 year old. That's awesome. And they can kind of knock off your, your woes because um, you can't really sit there and worry about all the things that happened because you're, you're in the middle of something brand new right now with them and they have no idea what you've been through today. And so that just finding ways that can sort of knock off these um, spiraling thoughts of despair or that can lead to burnout. Now, I'm not saying that I'm great at any of those things and I feel burned out quite a lot. Um, and my wife would tell you that as well. Um, so it is a real thing. And I think when you are really aware of it, you can start to impact it. Um, most people don't know it until they're having thoughts of feeling like quitting or getting in fights with their boss or being, I don't know, feeling like nothing ever works out or. Yeah. Because we're constantly trying to pave the way for the future of music therapy as well. And we can't, we can't get caught up in all of the weeds. We have to zoom back out every now and then and know that today was awesome. And it's the same thing that I, I try to celebrate with the patients. And it's why we, we made that remix with my morning jacket for the victory dance, which Love is that. to celebrate today. You know, we don't have to think about these, you know, finishing treatment or finishing your internship or finishing whatever thesis or like we can celebrate all of the awesome things that we were able to do today. Yeah. And take a moment to be like, yes. And I feel like that can offset some of that building of burnout. Yeah. I, um, off topic, but my morning jacket, is, I had not listened to a lot of their music and I went to a concert of theirs in Louisville, like, six years ago, it was the best concert to this day that I have ever been to in my life. They're amazing. And it's because they like, let go and yeah. they want to have fun and yeah. they want to celebrate, even yeah. if they're talking about serious things yeah. or not serious things. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're big advocates for music therapy as well. Um, that's great. Yeah. There's, there's, so I think that's important too, to, to make connections and with some of your favorite bands and try to, hook them up with some of your patients and yeah it, it's not asking a favor for you and it's not about us at all it's about them and the patient and some really magical things can happen yeah and I yeah I totally agree I think that that's an important piece of what we do too is advocating the world at large and that's like such a good way of spreading it yes. which leads me to my question um what does advocacy look like to you <laughs> So I think, I mean, it's, it's a, a number of things, which is celebrating each other, yeah. celebrating their work, yeah. spreading that around the social medias, um, doing talks like this, doing presentations in non-music therapy arenas, mm -hmm. um, maybe trying to write some papers that aren't just for music therapists. Um, it could mean also reaching out to different people on your interdisciplinary team that you might be friends with, like a doctor or a nurse or, you know, a social worker that loves to read and write to and wants to do something that's collaborative. Um, I think finding people that can celebrate us outside of our field is important. Um, I think making videos are important because some people, we can talk about it, we can write about it, we can read right. other people's thoughts about it, but I feel like some people, especially in this time that we're in right now, and a lot of people stuck at home, need good stories and they want to see it. And some people have to see it to believe it. And it's some of those little videos that can swim around that get a lot of people's attention that can then spread to cooler things that were never possible before. Yeah. And I love your piece about working with people outside of music therapy. It can often feel comfortable to work with people who get it. Um, but I'm working on some research right now with a child life specialist and a physician, and 
I don't know a lot about research. I didn't learn a ton in school when I was an undergrad and a little bit in grad, but having those people who can help you along and know the process really well can only build each other up. Well, and it's a tall order to think that you can be a great listener, a great person, a great musician, a great writer, a, a, and right. are very and interested in everything. research and advocating at all of those levels all the time. Yeah. Um, and then I've, I've really been intrigued lately. This is kind of off topic a little bit. Um, oh. Just with our field of music therapy in the future of it being such a white Mm-hmm. And yeah. not even thinking that I'm a minority as a white male in this, um, but how how we've gotten to where we are and yeah. how things are kind of in a, a place that I think we are feeling some of these natural growing pains yeah. of this yep. isn't a white no a white thing. And yeah. it's not it's not just for white women. It's you know the price so, of the century. I know. <laughs> So yeah, so figuring out ways to actually make going to school for this reasonable, um, paid internships. Mm -hmm. Um, And so to me, that's, that's some of the advocating that some of us olders need to talk some of our older folks into how can we really start to make some true change. Yeah. And make it real. Um, And lasting. And lasting. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so if you could take on a new project at work or outside of work, I know you're super involved. You have that documentary, um, mm-hmm. you have your website. What's another project you think you would take on? So I'm working on one um, that's here locally with, I've done, I think it's 192 heartbeat recordings. Wow. And that's that's just, I had to make a cutoff. It's actually up to 280 now. Oh. Um and just the 192 I've done, I don't need the IRB. So I've, I've, and it's such excruciation going I through all of this. 100% understand. Um, but it's, it's so cool to sort of try to study your own work and to figure yeah. out what, so it's a survey basically for these 192 people and what these recordings mean to them. And it's really just trying to get to the bottom of their life cycle. Like, when do you listen to it? If you listen to it, do you even know that you have it and how that might have been also involved in how it was introduced when it was introduced? You know, if we had 81 sessions versus one Mm -hmm. and, um, but it was really interesting for me to sort of go through these 192 recordings, which ended up being nine and a half hours of music. I bet. With these patients that we've made or I've made over the last four years with them. And so I've gotten to a place where I'm, a lot of it's done, but Joanne Lowy, who loves to write, is going to help me finish that. So it, again, asking for help from even someone as long ago as your internship supervisor um, that might be helpful to, like I've gotten it to this place where my brain is just not able. It's helpful to, to have fresh eyes. I need fresh eyes on it. And then, so I'm, that's getting close to being done. But, and it was nice, you know, thinking about like how Clive and, and Paul Nordoff would review their videos. Mm-hmm. And it's curious just even in the four years, how different I've changed in my approach to a lot of this and how different the recording sound. Um, and it was good to kind of reflect through some of that as well. Um, and then Claire Getty has been very sweet to, right. to help me. Um, one of the first patients that we did this intervention with, that was actually the one that we made that video with back at Cincinnati Children's. He's been willing to be uh, an active part of our research. So he's gonna write this paper with us and it's gonna follow the last six years of his relationship with this recording. Wow. And do a real nice qualitative case study. That, that is too cool. And we'll have so, to chat about that later that my research is kind of tying into your stuff so (laughs) so yeah so trying to nerd out with some of that trying to get you know i think this is i don't own this intervention um i like trying out new things and i feel like we need to work together to make yeah make it understandable to everyone that we're trying to do it with um and then i play with a few different bands in town i like doing that and you know just trying to be a cool dad and a sweet husband yeah 
and a good person on earth and to celebrate <laughs> gay rights and racial equality yeah, and absolutely. everything else that we can do right now. Yeah, beautifully said. And I'm curious too, this isn't one of the questions on here, but how do you feel like, you know, pioneering heartbeat songs has, like, how has that experience been for you? You know, I'm sure so many people come to you and want to learn more about it or, you know, I feel and like- I'm, I feel like I'm learning along with them as well. Yeah. So I think that's why I feel so open about it. You know, there's a time where my dad was like, you should try to patent this and, and you can't patent a process. Yeah. And to me, it, it's really just putting together things that were in existence which is kind of what we should be doing as creative, you know, medical music therapists any, anyway, which is using parts that are working with our patients, amplifying them and using something as simple as their internal rhythm to yeah. create something rhythmic or harmonic out of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think, I think, yeah, we just, we need to continue to work together and I want, I want this to be an open please and, Thank you <laughs> to let's collaborate and, and try to figure all this out together. Yeah. Cause it's, it's not just about one of us. It's not about, right. so yeah, going back to that competition, I, I want everyone to use this if it's useful to them. Yeah. And I don't, I, I like having street credit, but I don't need people to say in their right. paper that it was pioneered by Brian Shrek. Um, yeah, I'm more stoked that they're actually doing it and that it's actually helping the real people that they're doing it with. Yeah, absolutely. So what in inspires you to continue being a medical music therapist and doing this work? I think, you know, kind of just recapping everything that we've been talking about, yeah. I think it's intriguing work. No one is expecting it. We get to be creative all day. You know, as if I just want to say I'm a regular musician, I get to play music all day. I get to make money doing that. It's crazy. I can support my family doing that. Um, so, yeah, I think just sort of bringing a little bit into that uh, normal awareness at the end of the day. Yeah. And it's kind of like that ritual of washing your hands in between a room, of like letting go of everything that just happened in that one so that you can be fresh for this one. And, and patting yourself on the back a little bit to be like, we did some tough things today and by we, I mean, I'm talking to my brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we went, we went into some weird spaces with some people and good work. Yeah. And we don't, I think often there is that competition piece totally that you're saying. And I think too, that we don't give ourselves and each other enough credit for this work that we do. Yeah. Um, because and I love if I find something about any of the heartbeat stuff, I love trying to figure out who it is and sending them an email and being like, great work. And I yeah. don't know if they know how that's coming across via technology. You know, it, it might sound very flat or like I'm snarky or whatever, but no, I'm like sincerely like good on you. Like that's what I'm yeah. talking about. Like we're all in this together Yeah. and we all need to be writing these things together. Yeah. So cool. So what do you hope the future will look like for medical music therapy? We talked a little bit about it, but if you could look into the future. I think it's going to evolve. I don't know if it's going to get married with some other professions. Um, I think it, it is difficult. It, some days that I, I have dreams about it being, you know, not having to describe what it is to anyone. Um, I think there will be a day where that will sort of be true. Um, but I think just having a lot more of a diverse crew um, yeah. throughout the whole systems of top to bottom. Um, and I think that some of that will have to change just in academia. And for sure, why does it need to be so many credits? Why does it, why does it need to be such a long internship you know, if there's someone that is so skilled in so many different ways, how can we get them as soon as possible to be board certified? Yeah. As an internship director, I think there's certain things you look for. And a lot of the things I feel like I look for aren't things that are taught. It's not like a academic knowledge or right. necessarily like specific musical skills. It's a personality fit almost. Totally. You know? Yeah. So I, I totally agree with you. 
Um, well, this has been so wonderful. I know we have a couple questions if you have some time. Um, sure. So we have one that said, what's the best piece of advice you've received over the course of your career so far? Whoa. <laughs> I think the best advice is is to try to find that place of love that you can experience with yourself, with your relationship, with your music, and that somehow connects to the patient. Yeah. So I think in that sort of love triangle that can happen between you, your instrument, and the patient, and then it going back in a cycle is the juice that is the best yeah yeah and it keeps you going like that's what keeps you willing to go through this again tomorrow right being uh comfortable with uncomfortable yeah finding that comfort in the discomfort no matter what is going on yeah um avery asks she or says she's a student preparing for practicum at a children's hospital um have you seen a change other than PPE with COVID? Um, I Not really, other than, you know, some places aren't accepting new students right now just because of the bodies. They want as few possible. Um, but there's so many cool things happening with telehealth and telemedicine. There's so many cool recordings that we can do to connect with patients, even with an iPad, even if you're standing outside of the room. Yeah. Um, I got a 25 foot cord for my Think Labs that I could <laughs> theoretically do a heartbeat recording from 25 feet away. You should do it just to say you did it. <laughs> totally. I yeah. know. Yeah. But yeah, just trying to be open and creative and just following all the rules that whatever yeah. your supervisor is going to, I'm assuming you're going to be with someone the whole time anyway. Yeah. So you can't get into too much trouble. Yeah. That helps. I uh, I think too, everyone's learning together. I can at least say that for us and like just asking questions. If I have a question, like people are willing to answer it, you know, and I would rather be extra sure I can go into a room or that I'm wearing the right things. So yeah, I think. Yeah, super and if you're being cool. like, if you wanna feel super helpful and you wanna try to get someone something to drink, make sure they're not MPO, make sure that the nurse is okay with that, you know. Yeah. Simple things like that, that you might forget that you were just trying to be extra awesome, but. Yeah, but they couldn't have that. <laughs> they shouldn't have that today. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, Brenda asks if you do rounds with medical staff. I used to, and I used to really enjoy spending a lot of time and it depends on, on sort of how your team operates. Um, like, for instance, when I worked at Cincinnati Children's in their palliative and hospice care, they met every Monday morning and kind of made a game plan from the medical side for the whole week. Yes. So it's like, who, are, who do we need to see first? And it was a really wonderful working meeting that really, like, set up the whole week for what we were about to do. Um, there's other ones that are so medical and have nothing to do with what we're doing that right. I feel like they can be a time not waster, but they can use up a lot of time that you could be that, you know, at the end of it, a lot of it doesn't pertain to what you will be. I mean, the biggest part is what PPE to wear inside of a room. And, you know, and in my point of view right now, I don't even care what kind of cancer the person has. So I, I don't even look to see unless there's something that I really need to focus on or work on with them that yeah, some of that very specific overly medical things I don't think are as necessary unless it's with the job and forethought to be like I want them to know that I'm a part of this team yeah and, that's and if you can interject your insight onto that patient that would be helpful for everyone then it is important but I wouldn't get in the habit of going to an everyday rounds yeah I'm lucky where I have um, a trolley specialist who typically send me all of the info for medical rounds, which saves me like an hour. Because so, yeah. so finding I a friend know. like that. Yeah. yeah. Cause not everyone needs to be there. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Carolina, or Caroline, Caroline says, I love my morning jacket. Their live guitar solos are life changing. <laughs> As you mentioned um, theses, I have been brainstorming ideas for my master's thesis and I am considering doing a critical interpretive synthesis 
on medical music therapy and trauma-informed care. With that being said, I was wondering if uh, the concepts of trauma-informed care have informed your clinical practice. Well, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin with that. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah. I, I feel like anyone that is in the hospital is experiencing trauma. Um, even, you know, I, I like to think of that, that people might rate their most anxiety provoking experience being their blood draw. Um, so I mean, just even from the get go of getting into the hospital, it's trauma. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think everything we do, especially inside of a hospital, should be informed. And any sort of theoretical I don't know framework that you can use to help your practice is yeah. always useful absolutely yeah. um we have one other comment from Erin and she said your willingness to help other music therapists has been so awesome you immediately responded back to my initial inquiries about heartbeat recordings three years ago and our process at our hospital has been so rewarding so thank you amazing yeah. Keep them coming. We're all in this together. I want to be yeah. as helpful as everyone. And I hope that others will be the same. Yeah, absolutely. And I think hopefully we can encourage that all together is that whether you're a student and you're interested in this work, I, I told him this like forever ago. Do you know David Knott? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, I like just thought he was the coolest and I thought Seattle Children's was the coolest. So as like a student, I called him up and I was like, I just want to like, know more about like what you're doing and like you know I think it's so easy sometimes to be busy and to kind of like write those off or um, totally. not be willing to talk to students he talked to me for like an hour and I just like I will always remember that and like feeling so encouraged um because he didn't have to do that you know he's been in this field forever and now I consider him like a great colleague and I get to work with him on yes group. and you know we're all in it together whether you're a student whether an intern or a music therapist so because very soon you're going to be all of those things yeah I mean if, if you're a student you're going to be one of our colleagues yep so I, I guess that's a, a great piece of not you know watch out <laughs> advice too that yeah this isn't you're not just like getting through school to try to get by and you're doing this to build these connections with these people that are going to be lifelong helpers with you as well. Yeah. And I'm doing that currently with my old internship supervisor. <laughs> yeah. She's so impressive. I met her one time at a conference and got to do like a 15 minute mentor table thing. And she like laid out all these things like you should start doing this. You should start doing this. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to write all these things down. Mm -hmm. So she is um, a powerhouse. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have so appreciated this. This has been so fun. And I just love being able to like sit down and talk with people and see where they come from. And um, I think it's super cool that you're doing yeah. these. Thank you. And it's connecting all of us in this time that we can Great. always use a little bit of reconnection. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.